Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, this is session 1B, Utility and Asset Management. Um, and our presentation today that Stephen is going to give is called Selection and Development of a New Data Management Tool. Um, and Stephen has 14 years of experience in the wastewater field. He's currently a senior civil engineer with Clackamas Water Environment Service within the Planning and Capital Division. Prior to joining Water Environment Services in 2020, Stephen worked as a water wastewater project manager and design engineer for a private consulting firm. So please welcome Stephen. Thanks, Angie. And thanks for having me. As Angie said, I joined Wes a couple of years ago as a civil engineer. My uh, primary job responsibility is management of uh, capital improvement projects at our wastewater treatment plants. I have a one you know, kind of surprise, uh, a nice surprise, um, has been the opportunity to take on little side projects to help improve our organization. And this is one such side project. Um, and that's the initiative to, uh, to improve the way that our organization manages and utilizes data. Uh, so before we dive into that, uh, a couple of about us slides. Um, first off, a uh, shout out to our new vision statement that we're rolling out this summer. Um, our vision is to be a collaborative partner in building a resilient clean water future where all people benefit and rivers thrive. Um, kind of the, the nitty gritty of it is that we're a wastewater and stormwater utility. Uh, we were established in 1974 um, to serve a big chunk of Clackamas County. Um, our service area kind of extends from West Lynn, which is uh, west of the Willamette River, all the way east to the base of Mount Hood. Uh, we have about 165,000 customers across that zone uh, and have, this is an old number, I'm sure, but you know, employ over 100 staff. And, and all told, you know, we have something like 25 pump stations, 350 some odd miles of pipe to collect and convey wastewater um, to five um, wastewater treatment plants. And we're treating annually about 6 billion gallons of water. Um, our two main um, wastewater treatment facilities are the Kellogg Creek uh, Water Resource Recovery Facility and the Tri-City Water Resource Recovery Facility. Um, Kellogg Creek is located in downtown Milwaukee, Oregon. That's just south of Portland. Um, it's entirely uh, landlocked and has zero room for expansion. And so you know, out, out in service area, um, beyond Milwaukee is kind of a hot development area. So in order to service growth in that area, um, West diverts flow um, from that basin south into our Tri-City Basin, which primarily serves the cities of West Lynn, Oregon City and Gladstone. Uh, we do that with a couple different pump stations. Um, that IT2 pump station right now can divert up to 12 MGD from that North Basin to South Basin. Um, and that's undergoing an expansion project right now. Um, at Tri-City, um, we're working on expanding the outfall. And then in, an up, in a few years, there'll be a project to expand the capacity of the Tri-City facility itself. So there's a lot of exciting things happening. We're a fairly complex system with a number of moving parts. And that's all just kind of give you an idea of the amount of data that we're generating and, and how it's important to be able to leverage that data to drive process decisions within the system. So Wes has a number of kind of existing pitfalls and challenges when it comes to managing our data systems. And a lot of these are going to sound familiar um, to utilities. Uh, the first of which is there's a lot of manual reproduction of data. Um, for an example, you, an operator may go out in the field uh, with a notepad and make a manual recording. I take that notepad back into the operations area, transcribe it into Excel. And another operator may take that Excel spreadsheet and transcribe it into our lab work system. Uh, you know, and each time that there's manual touching of that data, there's a chance for error. Uh, there's also a lot of data silos. Um, I've interviewed uh, a number of our operations staff over the course of this project, um, and I'm still finding new spreadsheets that are being housed somewhere on our server that are critical for somebody's job, but that 
nobody else knows about. And, you know, and then there's the sheer volume of information. We collect a lot of data points and they're not always easy to get to. And so distilling that data down into a key performance indicator in order to drive a process decision is difficult. And then kind of the deeper I got into this project, the more I realized one of our main pain points was the ability to um, leverage a reporting tool with our existing system. Um, at, at, at some point, the best tool available to our staff was our LIM system for reporting. Um, it has some built-in reporting capabilities. It can make calculations. It can output to Excel. Um, and so we set up that LIM system as kind of our main report generator. But in order to, to use um, LIMS in that way, we had to have a way to get data into LIMS. And so um, you know, our operators are literally taking historians' uh, data, transcribing it manually, moving it over into LIMS so that it exists in LIMS so that we can then leverage the reporting capabilities from LIMS to spit out a report you know, to help drive a process decision or, or um, uh, report to a regulatory agency. Um, so it's all very cumbersome. And then layered on top of that is the uh, reporting feature within LIMS itself. Um, it's difficult to use. It requires specialized IT staff to modify those reports or to create new reports. So an operator him or herself can't create a new report um, or modify one as needed. So faced with these challenges, um, the process software initiative was born. Um, this is something that we identified in our CIP a few years ago. Uh, we budgeted $100,000 for procurement of a piece of software and for implementation of that software. Um, and at that point, we assembled the stakeholders. Um, we had representatives from our engineering group, that was me, um, our ops group, you know, from all our main facilities and field staff, uh, members from our laboratory team, you know, they managed the LIM system, which we'd be connecting to. Uh, and then our asset management group, which is kind of where we house all of our IT type support staff. And we began the software search. Um, kind of at the onset of that, we, we all met uh, all those stakeholders I just identified and kind of laid out what we saw as our desired outcome. Um, and essentially that was the creation of this new box uh, this data management box, which for us would be a new piece of software. And it would act as a central hub and automatically interface with some of our other sources of data, as well as you know, serve as a new database for all of our manually entered field data that currently lives either on pieces of paper or in spreadsheets across our system. And then, you know, we still had a lot of question marks at this point. There's, you know, our pump station data, some of which is connected to historian, some isn't. Um, and then collection system flow monitoring data, which was stored in the cloud. We weren't sure you know, what might happen to that data. Um, so, you know, there was some uncertainties at the start of our search. Um, we did have some experience with some, you know, off the shelf alternatives. Our staff you know, had, at other facilities uh, was familiar with pieces of software. And so we kind of weighed the pros and cons of those known software. Um, and then developed a list of area contacts. And basically we picked up the phone and, and called you all um, and asked, what are you doing? What do you like? Uh, what are the challenges with uh, what you're using? And, and kind of made a big list of options and, and narrowed down our focus. Um, the next step in the process was the RFQ process. Um, I'll be honest, at this point, we thought we had already made our decision on which piece of software would be best kind of wrote the, uh, the scope with that piece of software in mind. Um, and some of those, those key scope points um, was that for us, we wanted a commercial off the shelf industry specific solution. Um, there was a time in our past where we had tried to develop a data warehouse with you know, custom solutions built on top of that new database, but um, it had, the cumbersome level of both maintaining the new database and building out custom solutions wasn't a good fit for, for our uh, organization. Uh, we needed licenses for at least 10 users and we needed to be able to interface, you know, primarily with our SCADA historian system and our LIM system. Um, and then preferentially also with some of the remote flow monitoring that we're doing. 
Um, we'd also like storage of data and a Microsoft SQL database. And then of course, kind of the key um, features of the system should be customizable dashboards, the ability to do calculations, uh, field data entry and reporting. So we kind of narrowed things down to, to three main vendors. And, you know, I mentioned we thought we knew what we were going with at the start of this process. Um, but, you know, score one for the procurement process. Um, we got a quote from a vendor we weren't familiar with. And, you know, kind of went back to step one and did a full evaluation of that vendor. And ultimately, it's who we selected and are moving forward with, and that's ERIS. Um, all three of uh, the alternatives, you know, kind of checked the box of being off the shelf and industry specific. Um, both HawkWIMS and OP10 operate on the Windows 10 operating system, which was our initial requirement. Um, however, a bit of a surprise was with ERIS was it's deployed as a virtual appliance. Um, so essentially we access, users access the system through a browser and the appliance which lives you know, in the county system is maintained by the vendor. So that's one less piece of software that you know, our busy IT staff has to deploy to all our systems and maintain, um, which, is, which is a definite positive to the ERIS uh, alternative. Um, you know, our IT staff had preferred building out on a Microsoft SQL database, you know, both HawkWIMS and OP10 did so. And something that kind of emerged as a key difference between the systems was that URIS doesn't require building out a new database in order to live on top of. It's set up to be a conduit to existing databases. So that's, you know, the, the advantages are that's, that's one less database that our staff has to maintain which was a real downfall from our attempt to do something like this before. Um, it also avoids the duplication of data um, rather than you know, building out, combining and building out a new database. It just on demand is reaching out for that information. Uh, the downside, I guess, is that uh, we're limited by the existing databases. We can't build out a custom database in order to build our product on top of. Um, so we knew that we had to have our historian database and our LIMS database in good shape in order to properly leverage those. And so with that in mind, kind of our asset management group started an initiative to clean up those databases ahead of implementation of this, which I think has been a real key um, to how we have been off to a successful start with the project. Um, all the systems could interface with SCADA and LIMS. Um, OP10 was a little weak on that front as it I think they required a, uh, the LIM system to export a CSV file, which would then be imported with the push of a button into OP10, which is not ideal until we wanted to avoid. As far as field data entry goes, you know, HawkWIMS has a mobile app available. Uh, Operator 10 was all Windows based. And, and I mentioned previously, you know, ERIS uh, manual field data entry actually occurs in a browser or through a mobile app. Uh, all systems were capable of dashboarding, reporting, and calculations. Um, of course, there were some pros and cons for each of those. Um, I, I think none of them are particularly strong at data visualization. Um, however, ERIS was probably uh, best on, in that regard. And then uh, another advantage of ERIS is it's a pretty intuitive uh, report setup, which knowing that that's kind of our biggest pain point now, I, I wanted the system to be capable of, I wanted our, the users of the system to be capable of making their own reports and modifying reports as needed. Um, and then another benefit of ERIS was unlimited users and licenses. And then I kind of had added this uh, final box or row, which was, wasn't necessarily part of our initial evaluation, but it's something that stood out to all of us on the evaluation team was that ERIS was forward thinking with their product. Um, a lot of the exciting things the guy was talking about in the previous presentation about, you know, either scraping external web data and combining it with our data or making our data accessible to a third party vendor um, so that do modeling or machine learning or predictive analysis, things like that. 
this tool would allow us, set us up in the future um, to either have our data available or to be able to go get data that we need. Um, whereas these other tools are a bit more, you know, they do the job, but they're, that's about all that they do. So that said, um, we selected ERIS as our preferred piece of software. And the installation process began. This is probably about nine months ago. Uh, the first step was just to set up server space uh, in our county environment. And ERIS deployed their virtual appliance into that environment. I had a lot of help from our asset management group during this phase. I, I really don't understand what exactly happened, but it did happen over the course of a few days, which I was impressed by. Um, it was a fairly smooth process. Uh, after that, we configured to allow access to the ERIS developers and they interface, interfaced with SCADA and LIMS. Uh, again, that took about a day to do, so a pretty streamlined process. Um, and then we began to interface with some of our other data sources, uh, primarily that cloud cloud-based flow data um, that I mentioned. Uh, and basically, it, you know, all that would, requires is you know, getting the, the third-party API information and um, configuring it into the ERIS system. The next step for us was setting up our manual field data. Um, there are kind of two types of manual field data entry that live in the ERIS ecosystem. Uh, the first of those is what they call forms. Um, and that's built directly into the ERIS system with their form configurator. Kind of the advantage of these is they're mobile friendly. Uh, the second, which is a sheet. Uh, and that's basically just an Excel spreadsheet that then lives in a window within your browser. So you can build that out in Excel first before implementing it into the system. So just kind of a screenshot. This is our actual system of, of what uh, one of our data entry forms is this would essentially replace the scrap of paper that the operator carries around during the morning round. Eventually, we would like to go to mobile apps. At this point, uh, the concept is to still use the browser-based entry for the forms. And then the sheets are more like kind of a wet lab uh, uh, type sheet. Um, you can see the green boxes in this sheet. That's data that's being pulled in um, either from Historian or the LIM system. Uh, in order to make a calculation within the field data entry sheet itself. And so as the operator is making their manual entries into the sheet, calculation can automatically occur. And you know something like SVI can be calculated there live, which would then be stored into the system. And part of the reason we wanted to set up the field data entry first is because all of those uh, new types of uh, manually entered data, uh, I'll get a tag, and that information does live in a separate database um, alongside the virtual appliance. Once that new world of tags was set up of manually entered data, then it was available to bring in to the, some of our process reports and calculations as we built those out. Um, so we kind of mocked all of these process reports up in Excel first. Uh, leaned heavily on our operation staff to tell me what they needed to see on a daily basis. And essentially what we landed on was kind of replacing the, you know, the large cache of spreadsheets that they all rely on daily now and to go look at trends. And, you know, along with that, um, we were able to build out some automatic calculations into those reports, things like loading rates and, uh, And, and things of that nature, you know, the types of calculations that leverage both story and data and limbs data and have it all in one place for operators to see those trends over time. Uh, and I mentioned the field collected data, it gets its own ERIS tags. So do calculations, calculated tags are another class of tag. Um, so setting those all up ahead of time um, will allow us to uh, organize those calculated tags when we do things like build out dashboards. Yeah, just kind of a blown up uh, view of one of these examples reports. The reason many of these cells are blank is because uh, the information relies on the manually entered data, which our operation staff is not yet doing. So you know, something like the number of basins online is necessary to calculate HRT and, and things like that. 
And then kind of the most recent step that we've taken as far as building out the system has been recreating the wasting calculator in ERIS. This is kind of the core everyday decision that our operation staff makes. And you know, kind of a key principle we had for the wasting calculator was to reproduce a similar look to the tool that they use now. Um, and that, that kind of that stretched across the, the design of the system. Um, it was important for it to look and feel familiar so that when we get into the adoption phase, met with uh, less resistance and, and make it as easy as possible for our users to adopt the new system. So that, that's kind of where we stand, um, with building out the tools right now. Um, something that we have been able to leverage since day one was the ability to query data in the system. And so what you see on the screen now is you know, a window in the browser. Um, it's much easier to access data for users now. Um, when it comes to data query, you know, it's, it's somewhat of a clunky process in those existing tools. And uh, not, not everyone across our enterprise is, is using them. Um, and so I think this tool will you know, be uh, instrumental in you know, making data more available to our user base. All you have to do is log in to the website, start a query, and you can search by tag name or description. And then you know, as desired, you know, that's, that's all tags across the system. You could search in one spot for be it, you know, historian data, LabWorks data, or any of these new calculated data. You can narrow down that tag provider if desired or not, just you know, populate the list from across those. You know, there are a number of sampling modes available. Um, one in particular I'm excited about is the ability to query raw data. I think that our instrumentation staff in particular will find that incredibly useful. Query timeframe, select as many tags as you like, and then run your query. Um, so just kind of an example shot uh, up on the screen now of what a query, query result looks like. Um, I think this is, looks like DO versus DO set points. Um, and this basin came offline um, over the course of this query, which is kind of why you see the DO um, act the way it does, but it, uh, it's a big improvement over the, uh, the current accessibility of data to our users. Kind of the next steps for us um, is to build out our main you know, key process uh, performance indicators uh, into dashboards. You know, this is going to start by having plant-wide dashboards across the different uh, process areas of the plant. Um, and then eventually we'll open up these into user-specific dashboards. You know, we're, we're at the point where we've, we've built out the tags uh, to support uh, bringing those tags into these dashboard systems. So I think uh, this is just an example, by the way, this is in our dashboard. And then we'll continue to build out the reporting side of the system. Um, next up for reports will be our regulatory reports. Um, starting with our monthly DMRs. And you know, something that'll be key for us is to be able to export those in a format that's suitable for direct upload into NetDMR. Then we have another, a number of other uh, regulatory reports such as um, effluent temperature, solids handling, and annual air quality reports. And then finally will be the rollout phase. Uh, the plan is to start with kind of a soft rollout with limited features enabled, um, primarily the ability to query data. I think uh, that'll be, it's, it's, an, it's important to us to get that feature out to our group you know, sooner rather than later, even before we finish building out the system. And then following that, we'll have kind of a sandbox phase at each facility uh, that'll allow a power user to get in, test the system, run the reports, quality control, recommend uh, improvements as necessary uh, before we do the, the full rollout. And 
and all along the way, we'll be maximizing the use of our vendor support resources. You know, part of the contract we have with a vendor is not only for the software, um, but it's for you know, building out some of these initial reports and dashboards, training. So maximum utilization of, of those vendor support uh, resources will be important for us. And then there, there will be a period where we're using both our existing um, systems as well as our, as our new systems. And so the goal will be to attempt to minimize the burden on our staff and by, by attempting to make sure that we're ready, um, have already done through our QC process to really streamline that transition between our older systems and the newer systems. And then the, the last step will be cleaning up those existing tools. Um, and then finally, um, you know, the future is bright after installation of the system. There are another number of other uh, features that are available for us to leverage. Uh, there's an operator e-logbook, or currently we use paper logbooks. So, you know, that's something that we could roll out, develop. Uh, they have managed workflows. Um, that's you know, basically assigning tasks to walk a report through the report process. Um, alarms, um, and then you know, a lot of uh, other more sophisticated uses of data will be available to us now that this tool is in place. So we look forward to uh, to what the future brings to us. That's all I have. Um, are there any questions? We can take those now. Great, thank you, Stephen. Um, does anyone have any questions? I can bring the the mic around. I see you. Um, I'm actually so, sorry. I'm just. I want to make sure the people on the live stream can also hear. So I, I'll bring you the microphone. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. That was a great presentation. My name is Mia. I'm from City of Portland, BES. I was wondering, um, is did you have issues with firewalls with your SCADA system? And is this new piece of software going to be on your behind the firewall? Or is it going to be on the business side? Yes, we did have issues. Unfortunately, I do not have the details of I was copied on emails. Uh, which I didn't entirely understand, but I'd be happy to follow up, get some some insight from our IT staff, and uh, let you know exactly kind of how we're set up uh, on that front. Thank you. Um, I you one thing you mentioned in the beginning is that you uh, you had folks doing some limbs and SCADA database cleanup before you did this, and I just I didn't, do you know what that meant for them to get it cleaned up? I have two questions, so maybe I'll I will let you answer this one, and then I'll ask the second one if that's okay. Okay. Yep. Um, I do. They um, there are some legacy tags that are no longer in use, so deleting tags updating descriptions that more accurately matched um, what the tag actually was. Um, I think there is some renaming of tags uh, to, to, again, be more consistent. And then there's also, uh, my, there are a couple different servers that our system was logging in and consolidating that into a single server was, was also part of the project. Okay, that actually nicely leads me into my second question because that cleanup piece is perpetual, at least for us at Clean Water Services. So I don't, you know, now that you have this new data management system, I don't know if you're, sounds like you're maybe, it may be too early for me to ask staffing wise if what you're thinking about, like, what does that look like for folks as time to build dashboards and, and manage data? And you know what I mean? Like just do the troubleshooting pieces that come with the, all the fantastic other things. <laughs> yeah, no, and that's, I see that as kind of a risk for us. Um, we don't have a dedicated FT to, to manage the system. Um, so it's, uh, 
I think going to be a challenge. Uh, I'd like to kind of codify somebody, an engineer from our capital improvements team to be dedicated to spending some portion of their time to providing process support um, on the engineering side. Then we'll need to find a champion on the op side too, as, as well as folks on the, the IT side. So um, we haven't built out staffing responsibilities for the system, but we should in order to, uh, to make sure that we're successful in bringing the new system online. I see two more. I'll start over here and I'll come back to you. So earlier on, you mentioned that there was some parameters that had to be manually entered, like, and I think the example you used was how many basins were online. Um, is there a plan or like a prioritization of to, for things like that, that you could probably look at your SCADA tags and figure out from whatever signals, what basins are online? Is like that type of optimization going to be done with this? Yeah, that's a good question. And something we've struggled with a little bit, kind of balancing and improving the way we do things as we're bringing the new system online versus maintaining some consistency in the day-to-day -day, um, way that operators touch data, use data. So what we've landed on is to mostly maintain if an operator manually enters whether a basin is online or not, and we're building that feature into the new system so that they can do so for the most part. But I think we are also improving a few different things along the way. Thanks. Kind of back to the, uh, the database topic that she brought up earlier. I'm just interested because most databases that I work with, their structure, depending on whether it's, um, whether it's a wonderware or different applications build data systems different, differently, the database is outlined differently. So does, um, does the application have specific drivers that connect to those specified databases? Um, or did you have to manually say, okay, these are the columns, these are the, this is what's supposed to be in here and manually build those connections. That was another part of the process that I sort of followed along with. Um, there was some, um, uh, I guess, instruction that the, the system needed in order to know what was what. It was pretty minimal from my kind of layman's uh, perspective anyway. I think these guys that developed this uh, software were originally SCADA integrators, so they're pretty familiar with that. And so it's been really good about like when we add new tags into the SCADA system, it's, it's really good about just bringing those in automatically and nothing has to be done. There was a little bit of initial setup. Yeah. I, I couldn't, that'd be another thing I could follow up with you on, some input right. from our Thanks. IT staff. We have a question back here. I, uh, nice presentation. Thank you. I'm Bill Owen with Multnomah County Drainage District. We're um, about to embark on a, a similar exercise. And so I'll connect with you afterwards about some more details. But um, one thing, one criteria I did not see in your matrix up there is whether or not it's GIS compatible. Um, so I wonder if you can comment on that and whether or not uh, any of those three that you uh, in your final list has that capability. Thanks. Uh, you're right. That wasn't a criteria for us. Um, however, I, I can say that yes, Iris is GIS compatible. Uh, we don't have immediately immediate plans to leverage that feature, but it's capable. Much. All right. I see you. Thank you. Sorry, just to follow up on that, um, the maybe another side of that question is a maintenance management system interface. I don't know if that's anything you guys considered. Yeah, um, we looked into it. it. Was a factor again? That's not something we're necessarily planning on right away. 
Um, and I guess is your question, is it capable of interfacing with our asset management system? We, we use Lucidy and I, Matt speak up if, if you recall, um, Matt's our asset management uh, manager in the back corner there. But I think that uh, there was not a really good way to directly hook up with Lucidy through the ERA system. That I think would have been a challenge to do so. Sorry. Yes, we we did take a look at it that, that it can connect. Um, we're looking at two different pathways. We've got ERIS for merging all the operational data, continuous monitoring, like Steven's been talking about. And then we're considering using uh, Microsoft Power BI on SQL Server for blend, blending more and more disparate databases into kind of power big data reporting in our organization, but Eris does have the capability to do that as well. Right, I'm just gonna really quick, go to one quick qu question in the chat and then I'll come over come over there. Um, so which work group owns Eris? Is it IT, ops, data, something else? That's an interesting question. Um, and I think it's similar to the question Adrian asked earlier about what our staffing plan is. Um, the, the, the software, I guess, was developed as a capital improvement project. So management and deployment of that has been through our capital or engineering team. Um, but, but at some point, the real users of the system will be the owners, and that's the ops group. Thank you. Go ahead. Good job, Stephen. Um, question that I have is, what would you say was the return on investment? What are you seeing as the benefits in terms of save time, accuracy? What things have come out of this that maybe were a surprise in terms of the benefits? Well, it's early yet in the process. Um, I think the, the biggest benefit I've seen so far is accessibility of data. Um, it, and, and, and save time it, in order to go find data and assemble it in a way. Often there's only one or two people in the organization that can do that. Um, so this is more, makes this more broadly accessible um, and also in, in a way that's, that's a lot faster. Those, those have been the main advantages that we've seen from day one and that we've been able to use. Um, and I think the rest is kind of to be seen. Right, I think we probably have time for one more question. Um, feel free to raise a hand. No? All right, thanks very much, everyone. Um, thank you, Stephen, great presentation. Um, and th thanks for coming. Thank you all.